We began the season of Lent a little over a week ago. We gathered on Ash Wednesday to mark the beginning of the season with repentance, reminders, and rememberings. Last Sunday, those of you who gathered while the cat was away, heard and sang messages about justice, the theme for our Lenten observance this year. Today we begin four weeks of specific areas where justice cries out for new life, justice for the poor, justice for those victims of racial discrimination, justice for the environment, and justice for the stranger in our midst. When you turn to the Bible, and in particular to the New Revised Standard Version that we use here, the word justice appears 194 times, and virtually all of them are in the Old Testament. Dig a little deeper, and you'll discover that the word for justice, mispat, and tzedakah in Hebrew are used by the prophets with astounding frequency in some prophetic tradition In that same prophetic tradition, Jesus' ministry sought to demonstrate that genuine justice as he brought it into the world of sin and brokenness and seeks in the midst of that world to bring healing and transformation, a restoration of whole relationships. One problem that exists is that biblical translators opted to translate the Greek word for justice, diakosuni, uh, as righteousness. Now, righteousness has a, has a religiosity about it, um, but the word should be translated as justice in all of its worldliness and political implications, and that's where we run into a problem. Whenever you talk about justice, you have to recognize that there is a political dimension to the matter, and trust me on this, Whenever a subject has a political overtone or undertone, I get mail. The correspondence usually goes something like this. I don't want to hear politics from the pulpit stick to spiritual matters. I completely understand that. And I agree that our world has become an overly politicized place. But there has never been a time when the gospel of Jesus Christ was not political. (coughs) Jesus was killed by the political authorities of his day. Jesus challenged the political leaders of his day with words that make our current political discourse seem mild in comparison. (coughs) Jesus called his followers... (coughs) You know, I didn't cough at all last week. Jesus called his followers to give to the emperors the things that are the emperors and to God the things that are God. (laughs) The late Marcus Borg reminds us the Bible is political as well as personal. It combines sharp political criticism and compassionate political advocacy, radical criticism of domination and impassioned advocacy of an alternative social vision. Protesting the nightmare of injustice, its central voices proclaim God's dream of justice, a dream for the earth. (coughs) Criticism and advocacy are grounded in their understanding of the character and passion of God, a God of love, a God of love and justice whose passion for our life together is the kingdom of God. Now, we should also note that the word politics, the nice thing about Colorado is that it's so dry that mold can't grow there. (laughs) I'm not kidding you. I got to Nashville and started sneezing and coughing within five minutes. The word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. Politics are that which is good for the city the benefit of the people, the blessing of humankind. When politics leaves some behind, when politics denies inalienable rights to some while securing and protecting those rights for others, (coughs) oh, you are an angel. Take her to dinner, Hubbard. (laughs) 
When politics protects and demands the rights of some and denies them to others, when politics abandons the work of benefiting the people, then the people, and especially people of faith, must challenge the politics that are in play. So I promise you this. I will not be any more political than I need to be, and I will not favor one political flavor over another. I promise that I will be an equal opportunity offender, <laughs> and I will do my best in the great tradition of Finley Peter Dunn, the Chicago newspaperman of the last century, who famously coined the phrase, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So with that word of introduction, and warning <coughs> and hoping the end of the coughing, let's turn the page. If you can read the Bible and definitively show me that God does not have a place in the divine heart for the poor, I'll buy you lunch. Now I make that offer without hesitation because you can't do it. <coughs> again and again, the Bible tells us of God's unflinching concern for the poor and of God's unswerving, unrelenting challenge to those who are God's people to do something about it. Read the scriptures. The words given on behalf of the poor could not be clearer. Happy are those who consider the poor, but the Lord delivers them in the day of trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. They are called happy in the land. You do not give them up to the will of their enemies. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed. In their illnesses, you heal all their infirmities. In the Proverbs, if you close your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry out and not be heard. <coughs> Again, the poor are disliked even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. Those who despise their neighbors are sinners, but happy are those who are kind to the poor. From the prophet Jeremiah, for the hurt of my people, I am hurt, I mourn and dismay. <coughs> has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? In the letter of James, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but have no works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. <coughs> now there are many more citations I could offer, but do you hear it? Could it be any clearer that God has a special concern for the poor? And could it be any clearer that God expects God's people to hold that same concern for the poor in their hearts and minds and actions? There are a few things we need to keep in mind when we talk about poverty. First, poverty occurs in all races and communities. Too often we connect poverty to one race or another or to one community or another, but that is simply not true. Poverty occurs in every race and in every community. In the United States, the largest group of individuals in poverty are children under the age of 18. The percentage is close to 50%. And just to cl clear things up a bit more, the greatest number of children in poverty are white. But the greatest percentage of children in poverty is found among minority races. Then secondly, generational and situational poverty are different. Generational poverty is usually defined as a person whose family has lived in poverty for two generations. Situational poverty is poverty brought on by a cataclysmic illness or a loss of some other form. Generational poverty produces patterns and habits which are almost impossible to break. Situational poverty usually brings on a temporary reduction in wealth and security, but the mindset of those in situational poverty usually remains with their previously held middle-class norms and values. 
Third, the fundamental reasons for poverty are lack of educational attainment and the disconnection of family and or community. Those of us in the middle and upper class have known for generations that the key to success in life is education. We begin from our child's earliest moments to prepare them for college and career. In my family, college was never an option. Mine was the first generation of my family to go to college. <coughs> but in order to get to college, you have to have good elementary and secondary education, and that education must be available to every child in every school in every neighborhood. It is an injustice to unfairly and inequitably place greater resources in some schools than in others. And in poorer schools, we must continue to facilitate parents valuing and becoming involved in their child's education. In Evansville, right here, according to the United States Census Bureau, 20% of the population lives below the poverty level. One in five. In Vandenberg County, that percentage is nearly 16% of the population. In the EVSC, nearly 60% of the students are on a free or reduced cost meal plan. There are some very uncomfortable truths there, and I don't remember many of them at all being discussed in the recent election campaigns. Poverty leads to lack of hope, lack of aspiration, lack of dreams. Poverty saps the soul and diminishes God's gift of life. Poverty increases anger, discord, and violence. Poverty wounds the world and its people, and especially the world's children. In Luke's telling of Jesus' famous sermon for Luke on a great plain, as compared to Matthew's setting of a sermon on a mountain, Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, <coughs> and when they exclude you, and revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. If we can mix metaphors just a bit, this is the constitution of the kingdom of God. As Marcus Borg reminded us, the kingdom of God is what life would be like on earth if God were king. It is God's dream, as dreamed by the great figures of the Jewish tradition, Moses, the prophets, and for those of us who are Christian, Jesus. It is a dream for the earth. If the kingdom of God is what Jesus was about, then God's people must be about the work of bringing that kingdom to life, a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of peace. That means we must continue to share out of our abundance with those who are poor. We must put our time, our treasure, and our energy into improving their condition, and we must advocate for them in the halls of power and decision-making, which are far more open to us than they are to the poor. We must educate ourselves about the causes of poverty, and we must work together to eradicate poverty wherever it is allowed to exist. <coughs> we must raise our voices, voices more readily heard by those in power than the voices of the poor, and demand that justice and equitable laws that break the oppression and the exploitation of the poor. And we must challenge the heretical participation of religious communities <coughs> we must challenge the heretical participation of religious communities who insist that the gospel of prosperity and abundance is what Jesus came to preach and that the poor are poor because they choose to be. Being God's people has never been easy. 
It can ask us to go against the grain of the world around us. It can place us in a position of ridicule and derision. It can endanger our standing and reputation among family, friends, and associates. It can, it can appear a ridiculous way of life. It can even demand sacrifice. Being God's people of justice has never been easy. It can mean standing with those who are nothing in the world's sight. It can mean speaking for those whose voices can no longer be heard or whose voices are not respected or honored because they are poor. <coughs> it can mean challenging the way things are or as they are erroneously remembered in the haze of nostalgia. But this is true. There is a special place in God's heart for the poor. And there must be a special place in the hearts of God's people for the poor as well. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And blessed are those who stand with the poor, for now and evermore. <clears throat>